Welcome to the Live to 110 podcast. I'm your host, Wendy Myers. Today, we are going to be interviewing Dr. Tom O'Brien about the many dangers of gluten. It's something that I don't include in my diet anymore because it is nasty stuff. This protein is eaten by most Americans at every meal in the form of bread, crackers, flour tortillas, pie, cookies, cakes, etc. Any food that contains wheat, spelt, rye, barley, and oats. Sure, you've probably had that on your plate in the last 24 hours. So Dr. Brian, Dr. O'Brien is going to elaborate why gluten is a silent killer and that it could be the cause of one of your health problems. So uh, Dr. Brian is uh, a, he's a physician that has dedicated his life to getting the word out on gluten to health professionals and to um, health enthusiasts. So today I'm thrilled to have our guest on the show. You can find him at the enviable URL, thedoctor.com, T-H-E-D-R.com. Dr. Tom O'Brien is an internationally recognized speaker and workshop leader specializing in the complications of non-celiac gluten sensitivity and celiac disease as they occur inside and outside the intestines. Since 2004, he has served as a teaching clinician for international audiences of healthcare practitioners and currently holds teaching faculty positions with the Institute for Functional Medicine and the National University of Health Sciences. And he also serves on the Scientific Advisory Committee of the International and American Association of Clinical Nutritionists and the Medical Advisory Board of the National Association of Nutritional Professionals. Hello, Dr. O'Brien. Thank you for coming on the show. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, first, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and why you have become such an advocate against gluten? Okay. Well, um, the British Medical Journal published a paper in 2011 where they did a meta-analysis. And what that means is looking at many studies on a particular topic and doing a summary of all of the studies. And they looked at what is the time frame from when translational research is first published. And what's translational research? It's research that's going to change the way doctors think and act in practice in terms of how they think about a problem and what therapies will they use. That's translational research. It's going to completely transform how a doctor thinks about a particular topic. The British Medical Journal did a meta-analysis of many papers on this topic, and what they found was that the average is 17 years from the time an article is first published before the doctor down the street knows about this information and is using it in practice. 17 years. So when they first started publishing studies about cholesterol associated with heart disease, it was 17 years before the doctor down the street was doing cholesterol checks. And this goes on with many, many different topics in medicine. 17 years. In the meantime, people are suffering and people are dying. So I made the decision with this topic of gluten sensitivity with or without celiac disease that that's not going to happen. Um, it was just two years ago that the International Celiac Conference um, acknowledged that there is this thing called non-celiac gluten sensitivity, NCGS. That means you have a sensitivity to gluten, it's making you sick, but you don't have celiac disease. It was just two years ago that they finally acknowledged that there is such a thing. And the result of that is that now there are papers coming out about this topic of NCGS. Uh, but the track record would be, it'll be 17 years before your doctor down the street, or 15 more years before your doctor down the street knows about this and understands how to test for it and knows what to do for it. I'm not going to let that happen because what you'll learn is that people are dying every day and the, the death certificate says liver cancer or heart attacks, and that they were secondary to a gluten sensitivity for some, not all of them, but for some of these people, like my father uh, or my godmother who died of liver cancer, but it was secondary to undiagnosed celiac disease. Uh, I'm not going to let that happen. So I put together this summit, this gluten summit, uh, where I've interviewed 29 of the world's leaders. Uh, of the scientists, the researchers who are on the cutting edge publishing these papers, and then the cutting edge 
clinicians, the doctors in practice who are well known, who are looking at this topic of gluten sensitivity and implementing some of these protocols, and then the nutritionists who say, how do you send your kid to school uh, for lunch? Or how do you order in a restaurant? I put all of these people together and we're offering it, it's, out, it's for free online. It's called the Gluten Summit and it airs uh, November 11th through the 17th. Yeah, and if you listeners want to learn more about it, you can go on livedo110.com. There's a sidebar little um, graphic that you can click for the Gluten Summit. You can also go to thedoctor.com, sign up for that. Is there another website they can go to? No, um, your your website is, is probably the easiest one for them to access and the most okay. convenient one. Perfect. So, um, yeah, I know a lot of my, I tell every single one of my clients to stop eating gluten, whether it be for weight loss or just for health reasons, if they're detoxing, whatever reason motivates them, because uh, I think many people don't realize the huge, huge devastating health effects that gluten has. So I try to give people a little, whatever their motivation is, I tell them to nix gluten for that reason, <laughs> because people just cannot believe that they need to take this food out of their diet, this, this protein. So uh, why don't we start with the basics for the newbies that don't know about gluten or have never heard of it. What is it and what foods contain it? You bet. Um, gluten is the family of proteins um, that are in most grains. But by, by the way, gluten is not bad for you. Bad gluten is bad for you. <laughs> Uh, because there's gluten in rice, there's gluten in corn, there's gluten in quinoa. They are not bad for you. Now, you could be allergic to rice, and then it's a problem because allergies are always the proteins. Um, so you could be allergic to the protein of rice, the gluten proteins of rice. But this topic of gluten sensitivity relates specifically to wheat, rye, and barley. Those are the grains, that's the family of grains that are toxic to humans. So. It's the protein in wheat, rye, and barley that we're talking about here. Okay, and so is it a, a specific protein? Like when you say good gluten and bad gluten, what exactly do you mean by that? Think of protein like a brick wall. Digestion is taking the mortar off the bricks. So you've got each individual brick, which is an amino acid. And the amino acids then can be absorbed. They go right through the walls of the intestines into the bloodstream. They just go right there, so small, and there's like a cheesecloth that's covering the intestines so that only certain size molecules can get through into the bloodstream. And amino acids are small enough to go through the cheesecloth. The problem with these toxic families of gluten is that the human body cannot digest them down. You'll hear Dr. Alessio Fasano from Harvard um, in the summit saying, no human can digest gluten. Let me say that again. No human can digest the toxic gluten proteins of wheat, rye, and barley. One more time. No human can digest <laughs> the toxic proteins of wheat, rye, and barley. Does that mean I can't absorb it? Yes, that means no human. If you are human, you cannot digest it. Now, if you could take the hydrochloric acid that's produced in our stomach and you put it in a bottle, Dr. Pisano talked about this. You put it in a bottle. If you put your finger in that bottle, it'll eat your finger to the bone in less than a minute. If you put gluten, um, uh, like a piece of bread, uh, 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 some bread in that same bottle, it doesn't digest the bread. It'll eat your finger to the bone, but it won't break down the proteins of bread. It just can't. No human can digest this protein. What happens is that because we cannot digest it, we can't get it down to each individual brick of the brick wall, it's like someone took a sledgehammer and broke the wall into clumps and you get a 33 brick clump, a 17 brick clump, an 11 brick clump, all these different clumps of brick that are called peptides that are made up of 17 amino acids, 33 amino acids, way too big to get through the cheesecloth into the bloodstream. But these clumps of brick, the immune system sees these clumps of brick and thinks that they're a pathogen, a bacteria, a bad bacteria. And the result is we start making uh, uh, an inflammatory response to attack this bacteria, which are these clumps of brick. 
So the inflammatory response in the intestines, this inflammation that's going on in the intestines, causes tears in the cheesecloth. When you get tears in the cheesecloth, now these larger molecules of these clumps of brick from gluten that couldn't be broken down into amino acids, these larger molecules now get through the tears in the cheesecloth into the bloodstream. And your immune system starts making antibodies to protect you from this invader that you can't use to make new muscle or new nerve hormones or new bone cells. You can't use it. And so your body tries to fight it. Now you get the inflammatory response that's in your circulation going through your whole body is this, these antibodies that are looking for gluten and firing these chemical bullets called cytokines that cause inflammation throughout your body. Now you pull at a chain, the chain breaks at the weakest link. It's at one end, the middle, the other end. It's your heart, your brain, your liver, your gut. Wherever the weak link is in the chain, that's where you will eventually get the symptoms of gluten sensitivity, wherever the weak link is, because this inflammation is going throughout your body. That's why one person will manifest um, seizures. The next person will manifest psoriasis. The next person will manifest achy joints. The next person will manifest fatigue. The next person will manifest thyroid problems and all the symptoms of a bad thyroid. The next person will manifest infertility. That's why the list goes on and on and on because it's a systemic inflammatory process that will manifest wherever the weak link is in your chain. Yeah, that's really compelling because it's really every imaginable health symptom and condition could have a root cause or, a, you know, having gluten be a contributor. That's exactly right. It would be very silly and foolish to say every condition is caused by gluten sensitivity and everyone should go gluten free. That was silly. But it's very rational and scientific to say any condition may be caused by gluten sensitivity. So every patient should be checked. For gluten sensitivity yeah that's that's very rational yeah and so what about oats um, I think that's something a lot of people have confusion about um, can you explain exactly why most oats contain gluten yes when oats grow out of the ground there's no gluten in them when you buy oats off the shelf there's gluten in them and it's the toxic family of gluten there's gluten in oats it's called evidence like there's gluten in rice and corn but avenins are not toxic to you unless you're allergic to oats. And some people are allergic to tomatoes. You, you can be allergic to oats. But to this discussion of the toxic family of glutens of wheat, rye, and barley, oats do not have that toxic family of gluten in okay. them. However, the trucks that are hauling the oats from the fields when they harvest to the manufacturing facility hauled wheat last week. They don't clean the trucks. So there's cross-contamination. So when you buy oats off the shelf, there's often gluten and toxic gluten in them. So as long as you're buying your oats from a gluten-free oat company, and there are companies that go a long way to do their best to make sure there's no cross-contamination, like uh, Bob's Red Mill is a national brand, uh, glutenfreeoats.com is another one. There are many out there now that are proud to say we go the extra mile to make sure uh, our oats are gluten-free. Well, they're not gluten-free because they have avenins, but they're toxic gluten-free. Okay. So, so one thing that is concerning to me and that I found very interesting was how the wheat today is very different than it was 100 years ago and therefore more pro problematic. Yes. You know, like it has more gluten in it than it did 100 but years ago. That's right. It's called the 50-50 rule. In the last 50 years, the gluten content's gone up by over 50%. Uh, it's gone from 2% gluten. Well, it's actually much more than 50% now. It's gone from 2% gluten to the earlier biblical forms of wheat to 14% gluten, toxic gluten, which is currently the uh, levels in most brands of wheat that are commercially prepared. Yeah, so obviously this is going to be causing a lot more problems. <laughs> yes, glu gluten means glue. And in Poland, uh, this is really interesting. You, you know what they use uh, wheat flour for in Poland? They add, it to, add water to it, make a paste out of it, and they use it as wallpaper paste. Mm -hmm. That it's sticky. It holds the wallpaper to the wall for years. 
years. Yeah, I, I remember at three years old, I made a pinata. I uh, I used flour and water and made a little pinata. Out exactly. Of it. <laughs> it's glue. Exactly. Yeah, so what health disorders could someone suffer if they, they eat gluten? You named a few, but what are some of the more common ones that people aren't attributing to gluten sensitivity? Well, there are some really common ones. The first, the most common symptom of any food sensitivity is fatigue, just across the board fatigue. Um, uh, and the, the, for all of your listeners, here's the, uh, here's the uh, uh, way to determine whether you're f- fatigued or not. On a one to 10, 10 is the amount of energy you should have. Five is half as much. Take your willpower out of the equation. And what's your energy? And, and ca- so caffeine I'm, out of the equation. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, uh, what's your body energy when you take the stimulants out? Yeah. And it, I, I teach our doctors to say it the same way all the time. One to ten, ten's the amount of energy you should have, five is half as much, and then pause, doctors, because that pause, everybody has a number. Oh, I'm an eight. I'm a nine. And then you say, but take your willpower out of the equation. What's your body energy? And you see people's faces go, oh. And it's like, oh, reality check, I'm a three or a two. That, that's the most common symptom of food sensitivities is fatigue. Uh, anemias are another uh, indicator, uh, not indicator, suggestive of gluten sensitivity. Very, very common to see. Osteoporosis is so common that in the annals of internal medicine, they said, we have no hesitancy saying that every osteoporotic patient should be checked for celiac disease as celiac disease could be the cause of their osteoporosis. So I show that study and I say, so docs, if the annals of internal medicine say every osteoporotic patient needs to be checked because it's so common as the cause, which patient are you not gonna check? And you see this look of realization come into their face. It's like, oh, I didn't know that. Well, I need to check every one of them. Yes, exactly. Exactly, because if you give the drugs, I think, and there's no paper on this as far as I know, uh, well, there are papers on, on, the, on the reality, and that is that when you give the drugs for osteoporosis, they're called bisphosphonates. And the studies show that if you look at the x-rays, you take bisphosphonates and there's more bone. And uh, that the bisphosphonates, the drugs work to produce more bone. But the problem is the bone is balsa wood not oak and the women the postmenopausal women that take bisphosphonates have just as many fractures with their osteoporosis as women who don't take bisphosphonates get who have osteoporosis the fracture rate's the same it doesn't make a difference in the fracture rate but what the salespeople do they show the doctors the studies that show the x-rays look the, look at the x-ray there's more bone and so the doctors believe bisphosphonates are what you should do but the bone is balsa wood. It breaks really easily. Mm-hmm. Why? Because they may have a gluten sensitivity and they're not absorbing the calcium or the vitamin D or the vitamin K that they need to make really strong bone. So uh, the drugs work partially, but not completely. So the annals of internal medicine say every osteoporotic patient needs to be checked. That's another symptom. Uh, the most common symptom, I think, is brain dysfunction. Yeah. And when you ask a patient or, or a group, I was, uh, I gave a lecture a couple of days ago in North Dakota. I was in Fargo, North Dakota, of all places. And uh, wonderful people and 300 people in the room. I said, how many know or suspect they have a sensitivity to gluten? Almost the entire room raised their hand. And I laughed because, well, that's a loaded question to this audience, right? Uh, but how many of you know or suspect that if you have an inadvertent exposure to gluten, it seems to affect your brain? And over 70, 75% of the room raised their hand again. Uh, that, that's the most common system that's affected is the brain. So that means brain fog or headaches or seizures or attention deficit or any symptom of brain dysfunction that a person may get may be because of a sensitivity to gluten. Yeah, I keep reading that uh, even a lot of people, if they don't have intestinal or stomach um, alarms going off, they don't have any kind of intestinal symptoms, that it's the, the celiac or non-celiac gluten sensitivity um, can really be damaging their brain. That is correct. And unfortunately, you don't feel it when the antibodies are attacking your brain cells until um, it's pretty far along. Um, and it takes years of that for most people before it's far along and now you get obvious symptoms. You, you don't feel it when your brain cells are getting killed off. 
until you hit a critical mass. No one gets Alzheimer's in their 60s or 70s. It's a decades-long process of killing off brain cells until you kill off enough brain cells that the symptoms become a little more obvious. And if you look in the history, there were always the jokes. Oh, I'm getting older. I can't remember the way I used to. Ha ha. Oh, how old are you? Oh, 36. No, no, that's not good. That's not normal. That's not aging. We all should be able to learn a new a foreign language in our 80s. Yeah. There's no reason why not. Your brain is supposed to be working that well, unless you've been killing it off, eating foods that are causing inflammation, pulling at the weak link in your chain, which in your case may be the brain. Yeah, I definitely uh, feel like part of some of the brain fatigue or brain fog and uh, mental fatigue that I deal with every day is, you know, I'm part due to heavy metal toxicity, but also because of the fact that I ate gluten every day for 40 years. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And it takes a while to rebuild those cells. And so in the meantime, being aware of it and being meticulous to not throw more gasoline on the fire is critical. Yeah. So your brain can regenerate after you stop. Yes, eating. yes, yes, yes. Um, it used to be that doctors thought that, you know, you kill up brain cells, you're toast. I mean, there's nothing you can do. Well, we now know that's not true. You regenerate brain cells. They're slower than most other areas of the body, but you supply the right environment and you can have some really good results occur. So um, let's see, well, forget you know the one in three who are sensitive to gluten. Do you think that everyone should be avoiding gluten? Well, you know, as um, uh, an expert on the topic, um, it's really difficult. Um, I've got to be careful as to what I say. Yeah. You know, and I, I can only spoke, speak from the science and then give my personal opinion. The science says, no, everyone should not be off gluten. But the science also says, if you're having an immune reaction, you need to be off gluten. I mean, that's obvious. Your immune system is there to protect you. It's the, it's the armed forces of your body. It's the Army, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, Navy, IGA, IgG, IgE, IgM, different branches of the immune system. And if the Army is out in force, your body's talking to you. Your, your immune system is saying, we, we got a problem here. So anyone that has elevated levels of antibodies to gluten certainly should be off gluten, or anyone that notices that they feel better when they're off gluten. Why would you eat a food that you notice you've got symptoms for? Well, the symptoms aren't too bad. Yes, that's right, they're not too bad perhaps, but they're killing off brain cells or heart cells or liver cells, and when you get enough of them killed off, the symptoms are much more frequent and they get worse. So. Uh, should everyone be off gluten? Um, the science says no, no, but those with immune response um, or with symptom response should be off gluten. But my personal opinion, now I'm going to give you my personal opinion, <laughs> why would we eat anything that our bodies can't really digest yeah. and, and causes inflammation? We live in such an inflamed society already. Um, many, most people have heard you want an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, whatever that means, yeah. an anti-inflammatory lifestyle. So one of the premises of an anti-inflammatory lifestyle to reduce your risk of different degenerative diseases is stop throwing gasoline on the fire. So whether you get symptoms from throwing gasoline on the fire or not is just a question of how much tissue has been damaged. So why would we do now? Listen, there's, here's the thing about wheat though. You can't argue with the value of wheat. It has saved millions and millions of lives. When we've shipped um, container vessels of wheat to third world countries that are having famine, you save millions of lives because you can get some of the calories out of it. You can get a little bit of the protein out of it. You can, get it, you can keep your body going. So yes, the body will use some of that, but it also will cause the tears in the cheesecloth, the inflammation, and the long-term degenerative diseases. So if there's nothing else in the world to eat, of course you eat wheat because it's going to save your life. But in this country, there's no reason. There are so many other options available to us. Well, let's talk a little bit about gluten and the thyroid. I personally have a thyroid issue and I've had to stop gluten because of that. And uh, so I, it's a personal interest to me. So how exactly does gluten hurt your thyroid and therefore your metabolism if you consume it? 
Yeah, because I've uh, you know I've been dealing with a thyroid issue for for a few years now, and um, I've just read over and over and over that you need to cut gluten out of your diet. So can you ex explain exactly why that might be a good idea? Sure. There's a mechanism that's very common, and I've, I've spoken to pulling pulling on a chain, and the weak link breaks. If the weak link's your thyroid, how is it, what's the weak link? Well, one of the con the most common mechanisms is called molecular mimicry. And what does that mean? When your immune system is trying to protect you, it makes antibodies against this food, um, the toxic proteins of gluten. And let's say the toxic protein is 33 amino acids long. That's the most common one. It's called alpha glidin. Uh, uh, it's one of the clumps of brick when we don't digest gluten completely, it's 33 bricks long. And I'm gonna say those amino acids are A, A, B, C, D. Now it's 33 letters, but I'm not gonna say the 33 letters. So A, A, B, C, D, I'm referring to alpha glida. And your body makes antibodies to alpha glida. Now these antibodies are soldiers. Think of Arnold Schwarzenegger with his head out of a Humvee with a big submachine gun, and he's got those dark glasses on. Here, here in California, we call him the governator. <laughs> so think of the governator with this big submachine gun, over there, over there, firing these chemical bullets called cytokines trying to attack the 33 brick amino acid alpha glidin, A, A, B, C, D. Proteins are made up of hundreds of amino acids. The blood's going through your entire body. Let's say the blood's going past the thyroid. The surface of the thyroid that the blood is going past is made up of proteins and fats. Proteins are made up of hundreds of amino acids. So the blood's going past the surface of the thyroid made up of proteins, which are hundreds of amino acids, Part of the amino acid complex there is A, A, B, C, D. So Arnold, who's firing his chemical bullets at A, A, B, C, D, anywhere he finds them in the bloodstream, he's got these dark glasses on, he doesn't see very clearly, over doubt. And he fires a chemical bullet at your thyroid because part of the wall is made up of A, A, B, C, D. And that chemical bullet, that cytokine, damages the surface of the thyroid. Now your body has, see, why do we have any antibodies to our tissue, to our thyroid or our lungs or our liver or our muscles? How come there's a normal range of antibodies? It's because your body is cleaning up the damaged cells all the time. So when cells get damaged, you've got to get them out of there or else they can malform and cause cancers and many other things, but it's a body's protection. Get that damaged cell out of there. So you make antibodies to your thyroid to get rid of that damaged cell. That's a normal process. But now you've had toast for breakfast, and there's more soldiers coming out to deal with A, A, B, C, D. Then you have sandwich for lunch. Then you have pasta for dinner. The next day you have toast for breakfast, a sandwich for lunch. Or maybe you had pancakes for breakfast, a sandwich for lunch. And now you've got croutons on your salad at dinner with a cookie in there. And you're being exposed to these toxic families of gluten multiple times a day, every day, Lots of Arnold soldiers are out there trying to kill it, and it gets confused and it goes after the weak link in your chain, your thyroid, because A, A, B, C, D is on your thyroid. So now Arnold's attacking your thyroid regularly, and now your body's trying to make these cleanup cells, antibodies to the thyroid, to clean up the damaged cells, and this process is going so fast and so quick and so constantly, eventually your body continues to make the antibodies to your thyroid on its own. Now you have an autoimmune thyroid disease called Hashimoto's or Graves. And that's the most common mechanism as to how gluten can affect the function of your thyroid. Yeah, that's uh, it's really compelling because it's you always want to think that, oh, I just have some disease and my metabolism has slowed down, but it's gluten is a huge, huge factor in thyroid disease. That's exactly right. And so, uh, what tests should you get if you want to find out if you're sensitive to gluten, and what labs do you recommend? There's only one test that's accurate, no, excuse me, 
there's only one test that's comprehensive uh, in looking for gluten sensitivity. Um, I mentioned alpha gliadin, the 33 brick amino acid. It's the most common toxic peptide of gluten. About 50% of celiacs have alpha gliadin being elevated. But the other 50% don't. They have other peptides of gluten, other clumps of brick that they're reacting to, not the 33 clump of brick. But every lab in the country that looks for a sensitivity to gluten looks at alpha gliadin. It's good that they look at alpha gliadin, but it's not complete. Because if you're sensitive to alpha gliadin, if it comes back positive, you got a problem. But if it comes back negative, it's not necessarily negative. All it's telling you is that you're not reacting to alpha gliadin. You may be reacting to one of the other peptides that the lab didn't check for. Why aren't they checking the other peptides? That's a million dollar question no one's ever been able to answer. And it's really just dollars and politics. And, but you know, technology improves all the time. I mean, the papers started coming out in 1999 talking about testing for other peptides of gluten. And the papers have been coming out consistently ever since. Now there's a laboratory in the last three years, they opened up three years ago, that looks at 11 different peptides of gluten. The laboratory is called Cyrex Lab, C-Y-R-E-X, CyrexLabs.com. That's the test that you do. If that comes back negative, likely you're okay. And you don't have a sensitivity to gluten right now that's causing elevated antibodies. Sadly, I have uh, many, many clients that have IBS issues and they go to their doctor and the first thing the doctor tests is a test for celiac disease. None of them have been tested for gluten sensitivity. What, you know, and they, their test, you know, invariably comes back negative and they're told that they can eat gluten. What is the, what's wrong with that picture? That's a really good question. And you remember we started off this interview with the 17 year concept. Uh, and it's going to take 15 years, well, not I have anything to do with it, but the pattern would be 15 years from now, your clients go to their doctor and he checks for gluten sensitivity instead of checking for celiac disease. Because celiac disease is one manifestation of gluten sensitivity. There are many manifestations, but we've all focused with blinders on about celiac disease. That's the only one that we've thought of. So if, if you come back positive for celiac, you've got a problem. You need to take care of it. But if you come back negative to celiac, it's not necessarily that gluten's okay for you. You may be manifesting in your thyroid with no damage to your gut at all, or in your brain, or in your heart, or somewhere else. And it's just not manifesting anywhere else. Uh, I've also heard that the tests for celiac disease, uh, that many of those are not accurate as well. And just because you have a test come back negative, does not mean that you don't have celiac disease. Can you explain that a little bit? I've, I've heard that some of the tests will only take, the, you know, you have to have 80% of your villi missing or the length of the villi or 80% missing to get a positive test. But what if they're 20%, you know, worn down? Well, this is really, you, you've done your homework. Yeah. Good girl. <laughs> high, high five, girl. Oh, yeah. Good, good job. <laughs> I like to read. Yes, yes. Yes, that's very accurate. Um, the study started coming out in 2005, uh, showing that uh, celiac disease, back up, the inside lining of your, um, your, inte your intestines are a tube, it's 20, 25 feet long, the tube winds around in the inside of your abdomen, it kind of twists around in there, but it's a tube. The inside of the tube is lined with shag carpeting. This I love that analogy. <laughs> oh, thank you. The calcium's absorbed. This shag, the B vitamins. The shags over here are fats. The other shags, the amino acids. All the shags absorb different nutrients. Celiac disease is when your shags wear down and you've got berber. If you've got berber, you don't absorb calcium. You get osteoporosis. So the tests that look for celiac disease are looking, uh, the, the markers they look at are transglutaminase or endomycium. And endomycium was the older version, it's still used, but not as much. Transglutaminase is more uh, sensitive, meaning it identifies more of them than endomycium does. Uh, but, uh, so mostly it's transglutaminase. 
The problem uh, is that the papers that the doctors have read all say the same thing, that uh, endomycium and transglutaminase are 97, 98, 100% accurate, completely accurate. So the doctors read these papers, they say, oh, this is a really good test, we'll do this test. Well, I wrote to many of those authors, many of them, and now it's more common knowledge, it wasn't five years ago when I started writing them, uh, that when these researchers do their research to see what kind of blood test is going to work, they buy a couple hundred samples of celiac blood. And uh, they're blood banks that have... Um, patients with diabetes, the, the blood of patients with diabetes, the blood of patients with rheumatoid, and uh, many different diseases. So researchers can buy these blood samples, and they're assured these are all patients with rheumatoid, or all patients with diabetes, or all patients with celiac. And then they can check and see how accurate their tests are to identify it in those blood samples. So the doctors have published the papers on these tests for transglutaminase endomycium, they bought their samples of blood of per celiac patients. In order to get a diagnosis of celiac disease, the microvilli, the shags or the shag carpeting, have to be worn down completely. It's called total villus atrophy. If you don't have total villus atrophy, you don't get a classic diagnosis of celiac, and so your blood is not stored in those blood banks. Only those with total villus atrophy, their shags worn down completely, is the blood stored in the blood banks. Researchers buy that blood. So the blood they're buying are all people who are at the end stage of the disease. Their shags are worn down completely. And when you write to the authors and you say, Dear Doc, in your study, did you look at people that had partial villus atrophy, meaning the shags are only partially worn down, or people that just had high levels of inflammation and the shags have not worn down yet? Did you look at any of those patients? And they all respond the same way. No, celiac disease is total villus atrophy. So unintentionally, they cherry picked their group so that everyone had the end stage of disease and so the test is really accurate. When you look at people that have partial villus atrophy, the shags are wearing down but they're not worn down completely yet, or they've got a lot of increased inflammation the studies tell us that those tests can be wrong and say there's no problem up to seven out of 10 times. Wow. It's called the sensitivity. And the sensitivity is 27 to 33% with partial villus atrophy, meaning it comes back and says you're fine and you're really not. So that's the, that's the test for celiac disease. That's why you want to do a test for celiac, that's okay, but you also want to do the test for gluten sensitivity, which looks at multiple peptides of gluten, because that's much more important than whether or not your shags are worn down completely. Yeah, ideally, it seems like you want to be uh, getting diagnosed prior to your shags wearing all the way down. So I don't that, really get that's that. That's exactly right. So that's are, exactly right. Yeah, so that you can uh, head it off of the curve. So are there any labs that you prefer to do uh, the celiac testing that you think is a more accurate or more sensitive test? There's only one lab currently in the country that's doing multiple peptides of gluten with the celiac test or just multiple peptides of gluten. No other lab is doing this yet. And that lab is called Cyrex, C-Y-R-E-X, CyrexLabs.com. Okay, so the same one. So they've got their act together. <laughs> they do. They do. They uh, have worked really hard on this. And the creator of those tests is a world famous immunologist named Dr. Aristo Vojdani. And Dr. Vojdani is one of the guests on the summit. And he talks about how he thought about these tests and how he came up with these tests and, and uh, his background. And this is the culmination of 30 years, 35 years worth of work for Dr. Vojdani to come up with these tests. And so are there any drawbacks of these tests? Like, for instance, you know, the studies show that one in three people have gluten sensitivity. 
Um, but uh, other studies show that even people that have just a tiny, tiny bit of gluten can have uh, damage to their intestines, even if they're not you know, full-blown gluten sensitive, from what I understand. So are, are, are there any drawbacks to these tests at all? Like what are the alternatives? Do, do people need to be doing a food elimination diet to be 100% certain that they're not gluten sensitive if their tests come back negative? The uh, uh, drawback to the test, is, the only drawbacks to the test that I know of are uh, if someone is on steroids, um, if they're taking steroids, um, uh, cortisone, um, hydrocortisone, or steroid inhalers for asthma, um, you can't test. Um, th th you really can't because it will come back altered. Um, it's not accurate. Aside from that, there are no other drawbacks to the test that I'm aware of. Absolutely none. Okay. And was that it, accurate it, what I said, that one in three people have gluten sensitivity? Actually not. Uh, what the papers currently show that you can stand strong on is 6 to 10 percent of the population. Uh, however, by condition, there are certain conditions. For example, if you look at irritable bowel syndrome, mm -hmm. and people card-carrying Rome 2 criteria, irritable bowel syndrome, 30 percent of them are gluten sensitive. When you put them on a gluten-free diet, their IBS symptoms all go away. So by condition, it may be as high as 30 percent. Okay, okay. But, but, but over the uh, entire population, what the numbers currently tell us is 6 to 10 percent. Okay, okay. And so uh, what about, so if someone had their tests come back negative, do you think it's a good idea for them to do a food elimination diet with gluten just to just to be sure, because I've heard that that's the, the golden standard for determining if you're sensitive to gluten. Well, uh, uh, the, the, the gold standard um, is looking at the immune system to seeing if your Army, Air Force, or Marines are fighting right now, ir irrespective of how you feel. Yeah. It doesn't matter how you feel. Yeah, because uh, you does. said some people don't have symptoms. Correct, exactly. Uh, so, because people are motivated when they feel sick or they've got problems, then they want to find out why and then they'll check, but it doesn't matter if you've got problems or not. I personally believe everyone in the country should be checked for gluten sensitivity because it's so very, very common. Uh, uh, but uh, the, uh, if you go off of gluten, you do an elimination diet and you go off of gluten and you feel better, what more do you need? You know, if you notice that some of your symptoms go away, whatever they are, when you're off gluten, and then you eat gluten and the symptoms come back, here's a rule. Body language never lies. And some people speak Spanish, some people speak French, some people uh, as a second language, but very few people speak body, meaning we don't listen to what our body tells us. So you eat a food, you don't feel good, you don't eat a food, you feel better. You eat the food, you don't feel good. Well, you think? <laughs> you, th you think? But then people say, well, I don't feel so bad, and I really like my pasta. I don't feel so bad. But what they don't know is the inflammation that's going on internally is killing off their brain cells every single day, or killing off their heart cells or their skin cells, wherever the weak link is in their chain. And they've got to cross that imaginary line. They have to have the straw that broke the camel's back. Now they start getting symptoms and they think, oh, I just developed a problem. No, you've had a problem for quite a while. It just wasn't causing symptoms that, that are a wake-up call. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm getting my gluten sensitivity panel on a couple days. Nice. So I'm very, very excited. I'm just going to go to my immunologist, this is Dr. Bernard Geller, very wonderful immunologist. and. Kind of see what's what's going on inside, you know, what I'm Excellent. sensitive to. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Going with my daughter as well, doing her too. Yes. So what do you think about gluten-free products? Uh, one thing my husband loves to do, we have my daughter on a gl gluten-free diet, but he, like many other people, just goes to the gluten-free aisle and buys all these cookies and wafers and all these processed foods. And I say, honey, those aren't necessarily healthy. <laughs> what is your... Uh, what is your ideas on gluten-free products? Yes, well, uh, uh, some doctors and nutritionists and registered dietitians are out there saying that a gluten-free diet can be dangerous for you. And uh, gluten-free diets are not bad for you, 
bad gluten-free diets are bad for you. So you would stop every morning at the coffee shop to get your coffee on the way to work, and you'd normally get a blueberry muffin. But now you've been diagnosed with a gluten sensitivity, and so you stop getting the muffin. You get your coffee, and you just feel that craving, but no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to have that muffin. And you're really taking care of yourself. Then one day you go into order, order your coffee, and you see the little sign, gluten-free blueberry muffins. There you go. And you, and you immediately say, oh, I can have that. It's healthy for me. As a matter of fact, I can have two. <laughs> it's not healthy for you. It's just not as bad for you. But it's not healthy for you. Gluten-free products, and there's nothing wrong with having a gluten-free muffin every once in a while. Who cares? Yeah. There's nothing wrong with it. But listen, let's, let's get a bigger picture here for a moment. Uh, the, the biggest epidemic in our country today is obesity. And, and which will then cause uh, insulin resistance that progresses onto diabetes. It's a huge problem. Uh, it is massive. Uh, when I came out of school, we called it adult onset type two diabetes. We don't call it adult onset anymore because kids are getting this now. And they just published some statistics a few months ago that show if the increase in diabetes continues, if it doesn't, like the speed get worse, but if it just continues as it is now, getting worse and worse and worse at the same pace, by 2044, the cost of taking care of the diabetics just on Medicare and Medicaid, that cost will be more than all the taxes collected in the entire United States. Wow. It'll bankrupt us. We need to wake up. You can't be obese. We can't encourage obesity. And we're, uh, our doctors who are saying, well, you should get a little more exercise. And if their patients are packing an extra 30 pounds on there, they need to get a bigger picture, which is, you know, uh, you know there's an article in the New York Times, so oh, about four or five years ago, that the mortuary industry is in great distress because people don't fit in the caskets anymore. And they've got to do double wides much more frequently now. Uh, as, as a civilization, we're killing ourselves off. And I don't know if your listeners know this, but they published the study eight years ago. And it's true today and worse than it was even then. And that is that your children, your newborn children, have a shorter projected lifespan than you do. Kids are going to die earlier than you. You live to 68, your kids won't live to 68. They'll die early. And it's the first time in history this has ever happened. Forever, ever. And we're just blindly going ahead, eating our muffins every day or our pastas and our breads. And, and uh, uh, Bill Davis's book, Wheat Belly, is an excellent, excellent read on this topic of how breads and wheat in general fatten you up. Mm -hmm. And we can't continue to fatten our kids. You can't, they're, they're gonna die early. And as a civilization, we're going down. I don't like to be a prophet of doom, but just read the studies. You know, it's like where we are today, I don't know that there's anyone in the world today who will argue that uh, uh, the environment is changing and uh, the greenhouse effect is real. Uh, there, uh, a few years ago, there was still some scientists that worked for these big corporations. Oh, there was no evidence, well, nonsense. Nonsense. Now, we all know it. We're experiencing it now every day with the floods and the increased storms and the heat waves and the cold spells that are worse than ever. Uh, there's no question that uh, our planet is in great distress. Well, the human body is in the same type of distress uh, because of obesity. So how does this relate to gluten-free diets? There's the flowers that are used in gluten-free diets are have a higher glycemic index. You know, if you eat two slices of whole wheat bread, your body thinks you're eating as much sugar as a Snickers bar mm -hmm. from two slices of bread. How about a plate of pasta? It's much worse. And uh, the glycemic index is how much sugar your body thinks you're eating, so how much insulin it makes in response. The higher the glycemic index, the more insulin your body makes and wheat is very high on the glycemic index bill davis talks about that a lot in his book he's also on our summit and you'll hear him explain that in great detail uh in the gluten summit 
Uh, so the glycemic index of some of these gluten-free flours is higher than wheat. Mm -hmm. So you eat a gluten-free blueberry muffin, your body thinks you're getting more sugar than a Snickers bar. Yeah, that's one of the biggest lessons that I think a lot of my clients are really blown away by is that when they eat uh, rice flour or they eat whole grains or things like that, that they are getting a huge dose of sugar that's uh, gravely affecting their, their health. So why don't you tell the listeners a little bit more about you and you know, where they can find you and again about the Gluten Summit. Okay, thank you. Um, our website is thedr.com. Uh, the doctor.com and there there are a number of articles they're all free uh, by, by the way the summit's free everything on the gluten summit is free it's free for you folks It's free for everyone so that this information can get out there and it doesn't take 17 years for our doctors to know about this that's why we're doing this um, at the dr.com we've got um, uh, educational videos and radio shows like this one on different topics that we've talked about. Uh, just a lot of information for people. Uh, we are about to launch a um, education program on how do you transition into a gluten-free lifestyle? How do you do that? And uh, a really nice hand-holding guided uh, path to developing a gluten-free lifestyle for you and your family. Um, that's and a really great idea. I think as so many uh, so many people have a hard time figuring out what what do they eat because they're eating yes. gluten at every meal. So I think it's a really yes. good idea. Yes, and I don't want people to go cold turkey unless they're really sick. I want people to transition so that they can be successful and make it fun and happy for their kids. And by the way, these foods don't taste like cardboard. They are delicious. These recipes that you can make and, and treats for your kids that are just delicious and much healthier for them. Yeah, I was really surprised. I got some gluten-free bread for my daughter and uh, that's made of other, other kinds of grains and uh, some are made from almond flour. They're fantastic. They just taste that you have to find the right brands though. You just gotta you know, play around a little bit. Some of them are gross, exactly but right. a lot of them are delicious. That's exactly right. Uh, what we've put together is a, uh, a list. Okay, go shopping and buy all this now and just stock your cupboards with this gluten-free soy sauce and these gluten-free salad dressings, depending on what flavor you want. But we give people the basics to start with so your kitchen is prepared. And then you start transitioning over. And, uh, so that's what we're working on right now. And I'm really excited about the Gluten Summit. I'm going to be there. I encourage the listeners to be there. I want to learn uh, more in-depth about gluten and the dangers it causes. I know quite a bit about it, but I want to learn a little bit more so that I can convey that information to my clients and listeners as well. So thank you so much for coming on the show, Tom. The show is really going to be a real wake-up call for so many people because it's so important to get this message out because people have a really hard time believing that their arthritis or other health crisis is caused by the sandwich they're having every day at lunch. So thank you for coming on the show. You're very welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, and have a wonderful time at the summit. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. If you want to learn more about health, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter at I Will Live to 110. I am also on YouTube at Wendy Live to 110 and on Instagram and Pinterest at Live to 110. I am all over the social media. So again, thank you listeners for tuning in. Remember the time to be thinking about your health is while you still enjoy it, not waiting until you get sick. And please go check out our websites. I, uh, I can be found at live2110.com. Kate can be found at fitness-broad.com. If you like what you heard on the show, please give the Live to 110 podcast a nice review and rating in iTunes. Thank you so much for listening to the Live to 110 podcast.